In 1978, two first-year undergraduates at one of the most prestigious universities in Japan, the Tokyo Institute of Technology, met in the Seibu department store, one of the few places where they could play around with microcomputers. Sharing a common interest in video games, these two students, along with others who met regularly at this department store, started the legendary video game development house HAL Laboratory a couple of years later, where games like Kirby, the Mother series and Super Smash Brothers were created. Together at HAL Lab, these two young men created the NES game Pinball, one of the first releases for the system. They were Satoru Iwata, who would later become Nintendo CEO until his untimely passing in 2015, and the other, Satoshi Matsuoka, who is today Japan's leading authority in supercomputers and a man behind one of the first Axascale supercomputers to be deployed in the world, the Fugaku. Powering this supercomputer is a revolutionary chip that gives us a glimpse of the future that's to come to computing. The A64FX is a many-core CPU, like AMD's Epic or Intel's Xeons, but at the same time, it behaves like a GPU, in some workloads matching Nvidia's most powerful offering, Volta. Not only is this both a CPU and a GPU, it's also considerably more power efficient than any competing products. The A64 4FX poses a lot of questions for the semiconductor industry. While heterogeneous systems are all the rage and hype around new packaging and things like 3D stacking are getting all of us excited, the A64FX features a somewhat traditional monolithic design. While Intel is focusing their efforts into a unified API around x86 and AMD is pushing open standards within the same instruction set, the A64FX is based on ARM, making use of its S SV vector extensions. Today we'll look at how this chip operates, why it could challenge Intel, AMD and Nvidia in the cloud and hyperscalers, and what it could mean for us PC enthusiasts. Just like Iwata and Matsuoka kicked off a gaming revolution in the early 80s, Professor Matsuoka's A64 effects might now turn the semiconductor industry on its head. A big thanks to today's sponsor, Hostinger. After struggling for months to get the Cortex website working properly, securely, and with fast loading times in my previous hosting provider, I had no choice but to look for an alternative when, after publishing an article, the website went down for a whole day because of a flaw in that old hosting service. At around the same time, Hostinger got in touch to sponsor a video, and I thought it would be a great opportunity to migrate the Cortex website to their hosting service services. And if I thought they were good, I would run the sponsor spot here on the channel. And let me tell you, it's been night and day compared to the vast majority of hosting services I've used in the past. The performance is phenomenal. The migration from the old provider was super easy. That chat customer support is quick to respond with no tickets or any of that nonsense, and it works 24-7. I'm really impressed with Hostinger, and I'll be keeping the Cortex.tech website hosted there from now on. If you need to host a WordPress website or an e-commerce store, for instance, I highly recommend them. Go to www.hostinger.com forward slash Cortex and use the code Cortex in all caps to get up to 91% off yearly on their web hosting plans. Link in the description. When I say that the A64FX is both a CPU and a GPU, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is AMD's APUs, which essentially have a GPU embedded into an SoC. The A64FX is completely different, it doesn't have an embedded GPU, it's just that its CPU cores can function in a similar fashion as a GPU does, but are also general purpose CPU cores. Sounds confusing? The A64FX is composed of four CMGs, or core memory groups. Each of these CMGs has 13 cores, of which 12 are given to the user. Each of these cores, in turn, are connected to one another using crosswire. You might be familiar with how Intel connects its cores in a ring topology on Skylake and Cascade Lake. This is a different type of configuration when it comes to the cores, but the CMGs themselves are connected in a ring bus, just like Intel's current lineup. 
The hybrid nature of this chip comes in part from this quirky design choice, resulting in massive memory bandwidth from the cores to the L2 cache and further down to the HBM, which functions as sort of a mix of L3 cache and system memory, but we'll get to that in a second. So even though this is a CPU, there are many elements inside each core that are very similar to how GPUs are configured. In total, each A64FX chip has 52 cores, 48 of which are active, the remaining being reserved for the OS and for redundancy. If you look closely at the chip, you'll notice that unlike Zen 2, which has a bunch of chiplets connected to an I.O. die in the middle, the A64FX is monolithic, with four dies of HBM2 memory adjacent to it. It would be easy to confuse this chip with a GPU, like the Radeon 7 or even Nvidia's Volta, but again, while those are strictly GPUs, the A64FX albeit similar, is also a general purpose CPU. It can run Linux and even Windows. So if you're looking for a super expensive HPC chip to run PowerPoint on, it will do it. Of course, the A64FX was designed with HPC workloads in mind, particularly AI, scientific simulations, and data analytics. Usually, GPUs are used for these workloads because of their data streaming nature. In other words, GPUs can take a ton of data as input, compute on that data, and then output a ton of results using the massive memory bandwidth that's typically available to GPUs. The A64FX was designed with this functionality in mind, so it too is a data streaming monster. Much like the RDNA and Turing microarchitectures, the A64FX is capable of sustaining unaligned SIMD loads and has memory aggregation. If this is going over your head, you can check out my video RDNA versus Turing, where I discuss how these two architectures work in detail. The massive bandwidth that HPM2 provides, along with the SVE vector extensions and the ability to work on different types of data like float 16 or float 32 or integer, makes this chip ideal for HPC workloads. You see, in HPC, memory bandwidth has become a bottleneck for performance increases more than anything else. In the last five years, we've seen growing demand for data-intensive workloads like weather simulations, geology, astronomy, quantum physics, fluid dynamics, pharmaceutical research, and of course data analytics for things like computer vision and machine learning. These workloads have massive data sets that have to move around chips to be computed on, so they need to be shared between potentially thousands of cores. <laughs> That's the basic principle behind supercomputers. You connect a great number of cores which work in concert to get massive performance in highly parallel applications. But how does the data move around? It does so using interconnects. So you've probably heard of AMD's Infinity Fabric or Intel's EMIB. These are high-speed buses that are based on PCIe and can transfer data at super speeds and with low latency. So it's exactly what the doctor ordered for workloads with massive data sets, right? Well, the problem is that to transfer so much much data at these speeds, a ton of energy needs to be used. Most of the power consumption in HPC doesn't actually come from computing, but rather from data movement. For this reason, Fujitsu has its own interconnect called Tofu, which focuses on energy efficiency, while still retaining high speeds and low latency. In fact, it's actually better than Intel and AMD solutions, and the A64FX is capable of a gargantuan 3 ter teraflops of peak bandwidth while being 10 times more power efficient than mainstream x86 CPUs like Xeons and Epic. Looking more closely at performance, in the Himeno Fluid Dynamics benchmark, a single A64FX scores 346 gigaflops versus 85 gigaflops on two top-of-the-line Intel Xeon Platinum 8186 CPUs, so a single A64FX is four times faster faster than a dual socket high-end Xeon machine, or eight times faster chip versus chip, all while consuming less energy. In compute-bound workloads, the Xeons don't do as badly in comparison, but are still behind the A64FX. In a real-world application like WARF, a popular weather forecast and simulation application, which is more compute-intensive, the A64FX is still three times faster socket versus socket than the 8186 Xeon. This is 
what happens when a processor is designed specifically for certain types of tasks versus the general purpose CPUs that Intel and AMD make that can go into consumer products or HPC or cloud and enterprise environments. In other words, the A64FX is a domain-specific processor, its domain being HPC, of course. Could this be the future of computing? We'll come back to that in a minute. If we take a look at the rack unit that's going into the Fugaku nodes, we see a few curious things. The first thing that will stand out to you is the fact that the dual socket board is water-cooled. It looks kick-ass too, it has sort of a steampunk vibe. Water cooling in HPC makes a lot of sense, not just for the performance and cooling benefits, but also for scalability. But another thing sticks out like a sore thumb, or rather, it's special because of its omission. Can you spot what What's missing in this board? <laughs> That's right, there is no RAM. Unlike traditional server systems, the A64FX doesn't use RAM. The system memory is on chip. It's those HBM2 dies we saw earlier. This is really interesting, as integrating memory on chip is going to be a trend that we will see carried over to consumer products in the coming months and years. So it's possible that as we get absurd amounts of on-chip memory, RAM might no longer be needed, being replaced by HBM or next generation memories, which will greatly benefit from being closer to the logic cores when it comes to bandwidth and latency. So while RAM currently offers us capacity but is a massive bottleneck when it comes to bandwidth and latency, if HBM commoditizes, like all the other memory types did eventually, the A64FX shows what can be achieved with large amounts of on-chip memory. We get the bandwidth, the low latency, and the capacity. So the a 64 fx doesn't use system memory, so what? What's so special about that beyond saving on costs? Well, it comes down again to scalability. Because parallelization is being brought to training, AI workloads are now requiring massive scalability, and the fact that the A64FX is so tightly integrated makes it a lot easier to scale as needed. If you have an x86 system with Intel or AMD CPUs and Nvidia Volters and RAM, whenever you have to add more nodes, you'll have to add more of all of these components. With the A64FX, everything is inside one chip. The CPU functionality, the GPU functionality, and even the RAM. Scalability is the most important feature of an HPC system, and reliability is the most important feature in the cloud. The A64FX trumps the x86 incumbents in these fundamental metrics. Now you might be thinking, this is all well and good for a HPC system, but why would the industry be interested interesting in having ARM-based chips like this in the cloud if the vast majority of developers are used to working with x86, and the majority of applications also have been coded for this ISA. Well, if you're watching this on your phone, guess what's likely powering it? An ARM chip. Most of the terminals on the edge are ARM-based. Your phone runs ARM. So why should the other end of data, the cloud, run on x86? Riken and Fujitsu plan to make the A64 for effects available to cloud vendors like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, which would create an ecosystem where both edge devices and the cloud would be running on ARM, potentially resulting in much faster performance and less translation layers, as well as a unified development ecosystem. Intel has been talking a lot about its one API, but what if the cloud just ran on the same platform that edge developers are already using, and on just one chip rather than a bunch of different accelerators. Wouldn't that be cheaper and offer easier adoption? It remains to be seen, but it does make a lot of sense. So, with the A64FX, we've established that making a domain-specific chip certainly seems like a better choice than using general-purpose hardware, assuming that the development ecosystem is well-supported. But what does this mean for us, PC enthusiasts? Are chips like this the future for our platform? Well, yes, and so sort of. As I've said in past videos, most of the things that happen in the world of supercomputers eventually trickle down to consumer products. A lot of the people working in HPC transition to other segments. One of Professor Matsuoka's 
students serves as a great example of this. Tatsuo Nomura, a former student of Matsuoka's at the Tokyo Tech Institute, is game director of the popular Pokemon Go. Nomura's research in supercomputers, under the guidance of Professor Matsuoka, was instrumental in providing Pokemon Go with the massive scalability that it has, which can support hundreds of millions of players in the same world. The concept of a singular logical server, which is composed of several physical servers, is one of the key innovations that allows Pokemon Go to scale so smoothly, and that stems from the HPC work done on the Google Cloud platform by Nomura. This gives you an idea of how innovations that are happening in HPC can have a direct or indirect impact on consumer products, including games. So for the PC enthusiast market, we can expect several aspects of the A64FX to eventually make their way into products that you and I can buy. The first one is this merging of CPU and GPU functionality. With advanced packaging and massive amounts of on-chip memory, CPUs will become very similar to GPUs. I believe we will also see the introduction of two types of cores in CPUs, as I discussed in my video titled The Future of Computing Performance from last year. A large amount of small weak cores will handle GPU-like workloads, while a smaller amount of strong cores will handle the computation typically done on a CPU. We might even see specialized cores that are tasked with just running the operating system. So in a heterogeneous chip, we could have a chiplet whose sole purpose is to run Windows or Linux or Mac OS. The second lesson that this revolutionary chip has for us is related to costs. Being made on TSMC's 7 nanometers, and with the costs of semiconductor chips rising exponentially over the coming years as we go to 5 nanometers and beyond, to continue on the bleeding edge, costs will have to be cut in certain areas, just like in the 1960s, integration of circuits allowed for the proliferation of cheap electronics. In the coming years, integration of different types of functionality into a single chip will also help with cost reduction. While currently not publicly disclosed, the Fugaku supercomputer is estimated to have cost about a third of what will cost to build a similar machine with off-the-shelf Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA parts, for instance for the Aurora or Frontier supercomputers. Choosing to integrate GPU functionality into the CPU cores allowed Fujitsu to massively reduce production costs. Now, when it comes to gaming, the massive bandwidth that will be available in future chips will mean that streaming data like textures will no longer have an impact on performance. Instead of loading sections of the map in an open-world RPG, for instance, all of the game data will be streamed instantly as you traverse through the game world. In future games, we won't see that annoying hiccup whenever a new area or new textures or models need to be loaded into the game engine. There won't be trees popping up out of nowhere in the distance, and of course loading times will be greatly reduced. Unlike AMD's Frontier supercomputer or Intel's Aurora equivalent, the Fugaku supercomputer is not coming into operation in 2021. It's being deployed right now, and will begin operation within the next couple of months. The A64 FX chip is available today for anyone interested. This chip is not the future it's the present. It's AMD and Intel that are lagging behind. The future, as we will discuss in upcoming videos, is actually tightly connected to Iwata and Matsuoka's pinball game that they developed for the NES as students back in the early 80s. You see, there are two types of processing inside the brain, a focused processing mode and a diffused processing mode. In focused mode, thoughts travel in areas that are in close proximity, bumping into rubber bumpers that are close together, so to speak, like in pinball, while the diffuse processing that happens in the brain is like a pinball machine with rubber bumpers that are far apart, so the ball, or a thought, bounces from all regions of the brain. In upcoming videos, we will look at how the growing understanding of how our brains work will greatly impact chip design, with things like neuromorphic computing and photonics for data movement ushering in a new era for 
for computation, but we'll leave the brain and pinball for another day. For now, the A64FX certainly poses a lot of questions for the semiconductor industry as a whole. It's a fascinating chip that I think has flown a bit under the radar, and I believe it has the potential to eat AMD and Intel's breakfast in HPC and the cloud, and perhaps even challenge Nvidia's dominance in compute tasks. Subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss my upcoming analysis on the future of microprocessors. This video is made possible by my awesome patrons. If you enjoyed it and would like to support my work, join my Patreon today and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server, where a welcoming community of enthusiasts is waiting for you to discuss technology news and trends. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching and until the next one.